Well, thank you for joining everybody. We will go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Josh McClenney. I'm the North Carolina Legislative and Policy Coordinator uh, for Appalachian Voices, and you are here uh, for our panel discussion on building an energy system that works uh, for everyone. Um, I'm gonna be your moderator for our panel discussion this evening, and we're just really excited to have everybody here uh, to celebrate uh, 25 years of Appalachian Voices, uh, all the work that we, we have done in the past 25 years and the work that we're uh, hoping to do going forward. So uh, thank you so much for that. We're going to ask that all participants please stay uh, on mute for the duration uh, of the panel part of the discussion. We will have a question and answer portion uh, at the end of the evening. We encourage you uh, to submit your questions uh, using the Q&A section on the toolbar if you scroll to the bottom of your screen and just hover over that in, in the Zoom window. And we will do our best to track that uh, throughout the evening. Uh, don't worry, we will have a, a couple of interactive portions throughout the, the remainder of the presentation just so that you feel involved and, and we're not just talking at you. So uh, again, thank you so much for joining us and, and we're looking forward to, to having this discussion with you. So just a really quick uh, introduction of our, our panelists this evening. Um, you can see all their pictures listed here, and I will allow um, folks to introduce themselves uh, as we get to uh, their portion of the presentation. So we did just want to engage in uh, a little bit of grounding and get everybody on uh, the same page. You've heard me use this term multiple times already, energy democracy, uh, and we just wanna tell everybody what energy democracy is. Um, energy democracy is the newest program at Appalachian Voices. Uh, and it's really about expanding the principles of democracy, participation, and transparency uh, to our utilities. Local people, uh, communities having a say in how their energy and where their energy is produced. Um, everyone should be able to have safe, reliable, and affordable access to electricity. Uh, energy democracy brings conversations uh, like environmental justice uh, and equity uh, into the same room as conversations about our energy systems. Uh, it's, it's a movement, a growing movement, I should say, that really values and prioritizes active participation uh, and asks that all folks have a seat at the table. It fights for sustainable jobs, community wealth, uh, clean, renewable energy uh, for members of all different types of utilities. And I say all different types of utilities because um, all of us might come from or, or use different utilities. Uh, the first type of utility, uh, the type of utility that I am a customer of or a rate pair of as an investor owned utility. These are private companies uh, that are granted a monopoly to provide elect exclusive electric service uh, within a, a, an exclusive territory. So the example of this that we have in North Carolina would be Duke Energy uh, or Dominion Energy in parts of our state. Other folks on this call might be members of municipal utilities. So you're served by a publicly owned and operated electric utility, typically set up by a local government to serve cities and towns. Uh, the city of Rocky Mountain, North Carolina is an example of a city that has a municipal uh, electric utility. Folks on this call, uh, especially folks in, in rural communities might be members of rural electric cooperatives. Uh, these are not-for-profit utilities, typically again in rural areas that are owned by their customers. Uh, or members, we like to call them member owners. Blue Ridge Electric Cooperative is an example, uh, again, from North Carolina of a cooperative utility. And then potentially some of y'all, probably a smaller percentage might be off-grid. So homes or businesses uh, that generate their own electricity and are not connected to a larger grid. And so, like I said, we'd like to keep this presentation uh, interactive. So we're gonna move to our first poll question, uh, which is what type of utility do you purchase your power from? And so if you wanna take a second and try and fill out that poll right now, that'd be great. A lot of folks on the call represented by investor owned utilities majority of folks on the call. 
And if you if you want to, you can put which which utility that is in the chat. See maybe if there are other folks uh, on the call this evening who might be members or, or rate payers from the same utility. A lot of folks represented uh, by municipal utilities on the call. No one who's off grid. Well, we almost have full participation on that poll, not quite. So I'll give folks just a, a few more seconds to participate. So moving on to our next question uh, of the evening, has anyone e here ever advocated for changes to your energy system before? Again, has anyone here ever advocated for changes to your energy system before? Whether that be calling your legislature, uh, showing up to a public hearing and delivering testimony, um, voting for political candidates, a bunch of different options here for you to select. Give folks just a, a few more seconds here to fill out that poll. And we will share the results with you on this one. I apologize for not taking the time to do that on the last poll. Almost everyone's filled it out. Alrighty, so let's take a look at the results. Looks like we have uh, several folks who are on the call that have voted uh, for political candidates that have supported clean energy. Um, a lot of folks who have contacted their elected officials. Um, several folks who have submitted comments uh, to utility regulators, maybe your, your utilities, your public utilities commission in your state. Um, and then a lot of folks who have attended meetings about clean energy and or utility reform. So a lot of folks who are active and um, engaged around this idea of energy democracy. Um, and as we kind of transition to the next part of this presentation, um, want to uh, just let y'all get to know a couple of folks who are part of the Appalachian Voices team, uh, who are, are full-time advocates um, and who uh, for full-time do energy democracy work and have been engaged on the front lines in various different states, different parts of, of Appalachian Voices um, doing that work. And so without further ado, I will pass us uh, on to Emily Piantek, who is the Virginia uh, Energy Democracy Field Coordinator, who's going to talk to you about some of the awesome work uh, going on uh, on the ground in Virginia. So Emily. Thank you, Josh. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. My name is Emily Piantek, and I'm the Energy Dem Democracy Field Coordinator for our Virginia team. I'm based in Blacksburg, and I've been working with Appalachian Voices for a little over two years now, um, which has been a really um, exciting time and wonderful opportunity. I wanted tonight to talk about one of the campaigns that I got started with right after I joined Appalachian Voices. And this was um, a, work, an, a campaign to reform um, a particular electric cooperative here in Virginia. And it's since expanded um, to include reform efforts at other cooperatives in the state as well. So um, Josh, Josh referenced earlier that electric co-ops are not for profit member owned utilities. And because of that structure, they don't have the same profit making motive as a private utility company like Duke Energy or Dominion Energy would. Um, and therefore they should be more responsive to the um, desires and input of their member owners. Um, the structure, the cooperative structure of electric co-ops is grounded in their history. Um, in the 1930s, only about 10% of rural homes were electrified. 
um, and rural areas were often ignored by private utility companies who were worried about um, the ability to make money by expanding out into rural areas. And so they were concentrated in urban centers. Um, but then in 1935, President Roosevelt established the Rural Electrification Administration, and this eventually enabled um, farmer-owned cooperatives to acquire funding from the federal government for the purpose of electrifying rural areas. Um, it was a hugely successful effort. By the 1950s, 90% of U.S. farms were electrified, so in just under um, 20 years. So... Um, that sort of spirit of democratic ownership control is still valued today. Um, the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, also known as NRECA, recommends democratic member control of cooperatives. Um, unfortunately, many cooperatives in Virginia, they're not transparent to their member owners. They don't engage um, member owners in decision-making at the co-op. And so they're not necessarily adhering to these best practices that are recommended by the um, National Association. And so just to give you some examples of what that looks like, um, most co-ops in Virginia have board meetings that are closed to the member owners. Um, they don't make meeting minutes um, or agendas available to member owners as well. So it's not clear what discussions those boards of directors are having about the governance of the co-op. Um, and they also, engaged in um, undemocratic and unfair board pre election practices where um, boards of directors can cast um, votes in the in the board of directors elections on behalf of the member owners, but it does give um, an outsized influence to um, incumbents um, for whom the boards of directors are, are more likely to vote. So it's difficult to unseat them. Um, so that's a problem that we face um, at a few co-ops here in Virginia. And this matters because um, Poor governance and a lack of transparency slows the transition to clean energy down. So when member owners aren't able to provide input about clean energy or energy efficiency preferences and help guide co-ops um, towards, towards those resources, um, those member owners can get left behind, of, they can get left out of the clean energy transition when their boards aren't um, progressive or proactive enough and aren't pursuing those clean energy options. So here in Virginia, we have cases where co-ops aren't investing in energy efficiency or solar when it would make sense to do so. Um, and they're also seeking changes to electric fees and rate structures in those closed door board meetings. So member owners aren't aware of the impacts um, that uh, the co-op boards are seeking and that can reduce, or that can result in reduced energy savings and bill savings for those member owners. So that's kind of, um, a quick big picture view of the problem. So Josh, next slide, please. Um, yeah, so I wanted to delve just a little bit into what I'm calling a case study at one of our electric co-ops here in Virginia. So um, Rappahannock Electric Cooperative up in Northern Virginia is the largest co-op in the state. It serves over 150,000 members, which also makes it one of the biggest um, co-ops in the country. But a few years ago, some member owners became frustrated by undemocratic practices, particularly as it relates to um, the board election processes that I named earlier, um, and decided to do something about it. So they organized and they formed the, the, the organization Repower REC, which was composed entirely of member owners. Um, and they began, began to advocate for some reforms to Rappahannock's um, bylaws. Uh, a couple of the things that they were trying to do was, first of all, to reform those unfair board election processes to make it um, easier for a challenger to unseat an incumbent and to make the process fair. Um, they also wanted to open board meetings to member owners and to have the co-op boards make meeting minutes available to the member owners following the meetings. Um, and then another um, area that they were trying to reform was the fact that board compensation for members of REC wasn't available to member owners and um, they felt that that information should be made public. So um, those were those were the reforms they were seeking and unfortunately all 13 electric co-ops in Virginia opposed these reforms. Um, next slide Josh. Thanks. Um, so in the face of all of this opposition, one of the things that Repower REC did was to add, was to collaborate with advocacy organizations, including Appalachian Voices, um, in an effort to make the public aware of the serious governance and transparency issues present in co-ops across Virginia. So we got together and we produced this scorecard that you see on the screen, where we ranked co-ops um, on a series of democratic governance items. So looking at whether or not their board meetings were open to the public, whether or not they posted minutes online, what their election processes were like, and things such as that, ranked it on a scale of 
um, 40 total points, and then compared those co-ops to model co-ops in other states. So as you can see, um, Rappahannock Electric down near the bottom of the screen um, is far behind the model co-ops that, um, that we have listed all the way at the bottom. So Paternalis in Texas and La Plata in Colorado. Um, and you can also see that 12 out of the 13 co-ops are in serious need of reform. So really not living up to the standard of democratic member control that NRECA um, recommends that they do. Um, so I will quickly point out though that this co-op in green, Powell Valley Electric Co-op, um, got a higher score than the rest. And that was the result of member owners organizing there. So Powell Valley is in the far Southwest corner of Virginia and some member owners got together and formed PVEC member voices and advocated for some bylaws changes. And one of those things being that they wanted to be able to attend the board meetings and they did win um, that. And they also won um, some other um, of their demands there. So we know that um, that change can be made and that um, member owners organizing um, does make an impact on co-op governance and leadership. Uh, but anyway, back to the scorecard. So we attempted to use this scorecard as an advocacy tool to educate not only the public, but also legislators about um, the need for reform at the co-ops. Um, next slide, Josh. So um, let's see, yeah, so what did I wanna go over on this slide? Um, well, I guess one thing I forgot to mention is that Repower REC did have a piece of legislation that we um, supported in the 2023 General Assembly session here in Virginia. We used the scorecard to galvanize member owners, to talk to legislators, and we had Delegate Wendy Goditis patron a bill that would have required co-ops to make some of the changes that we were advocating, including opening board meetings to the member owners and making the minutes available. Um, and unfortunately, that um, effort was not successful, but um, we're not giving up. And we're gonna work harder this year and continue organizing with those member owners to build that grassroots power, um, to conduct outreach and education using the scorecard, using other resources, um, having those one-on-one -on -one conversations with other member owners about um, what their opportunities are as member owners of electric co-ops and why it's important for them to, um, to get engaged and to advocate for, for democratic member control. Um, we're also, in the past, we've done some regulatory intervention and have engaged in some litigation um, where appropriate. And so we'll continue to look for those opportunities um, to seek reforms as well. And then finally, you know, legis another legislative campaign isn't off the table necessarily. And we um, intend to continue supporting Repower REC in those efforts and in um, educating legislators about the issues as well. Um, so that's kind of a quick snapshot of our campaign to reform Rappahannock. And as I mentioned, we're expanding the campaign to build power at other um, co-ops in Virginia and try to advocate for these reforms. Um, I have one more slide, which is um, a little bit more general. So um, even if you're not a member of an electric co-op, one of the things that you can do here in Virginia to help um, reform co-ops and help them make that transition to clean energy is actually to call Senator Warner. And there's a timely opportunity to speak to him and ask him to prioritize passing the budget reconciliation bill that the House passed in 2021. This is a $555 billion package that includes some climate and clean energy funding for co-ops. So there's about $10 billion in that package that would help reduce electric co-ops reliance on fossil fuels by financing their switch from coal to clean energy options. And then there's another almost $3 billion that would provide forgivable loans for co-ops to um, produce their own solar and to build out their solar resources. So again, to make, um, to, to reduce their reliance on fossil fuels and to help them transition to clean energy. So um, I think we have, yes, thank you, Jen. So we have um, an action in the chat with Senator Warner's number and we just encourage everyone in Virginia to give him a call today and ask him to prioritize passing that spending package. So um, that's it for me. Uh, I am going to pass things over to our next speaker, Maddie Koch. Thanks, Emily. Um, and thanks for the awesome co-op history. Um, so my name's Maddie. I'm a newer employee of App Voices. I started back in March. Um, so I'm an energy democracy organizer for North Carolina. And I have, um, I'm gonna share with you a very new initiative that we are starting in the town of Boone. Um, so this is with a, utility company there that I'll get into because it's a little different than some of the ones that we've talked about. So this is New River Light and Power. 
Um, and we're also collaborating with the town of Boone. So these four bullets here are just the things that we'll sort of address that create these um, really unique contexts for our platform and our initiative. Um, so Josh, you can go ahead to the next slide. So initially Appalachian Voices back in um, early 2020 was engaged in um, New River Light and Power was I'm going to increase a rate for solar customers and Appalachian Voices really wanted to get involved and prevent that from happening. Um, and then we really saw this like broader opportunity to work with the town of Boone and the utility company. Um, so these are some of these are our three main goals is to work with the town of Boone and create this um, hopefully win win situation and make solar more financially viable for individual ratepayers and add more renewable energy to the grid, which is a really new push um, that I'll get into a little bit more. So Josh, if you wanna to go to the next slide. So a little bit more about the town of Boone, cause I know we have people from all over. So the town of Boone um, has about 20,000 full-time residents. Um, it's in the Northwest corner of North Carolina. We're like pretty close to the Tennessee line. Um, the town of Boone also has Appalachian State University, and which the university is almost the size of the small town of Boone. Um, and the town of Boone um, has really robust climate goals. And there is room for us to work with Appalachian State University as well, which has a really robust um, sustainability department and a lot of really amazing professors with lots of expertise and room for collaboration. So the town of Boone, um, as of in 2016, they passed um, climate goals. And then in 2019, they really bulleted these three climate goals here. So there's the climate neutrality and municipal operations by 2030. There's transition municipal operations to 100% clean renewable energy by 2040. And then transition the entire town of Boone to 100% by 2050. So that second point there is highlighted because as of 2020 this year, um, the municipal, the municipality actually reached that goal already, um, which is really exciting, but there's also some room for growth that I'll talk about. So their transition onto this, re onto renewable energy is from, a, is in collaboration with New River Light and Power, and as well as Blue Ridge Electric, which is a co-op and you can see um, Blue Ridge is supplying solar, which their solar field is the right hand corner image. And then um, New River Light and Power is supplying hydro. So you can move to the next slide. So um, New River Light and Power has launched a, so this is again, the utility company. Um, they supply around 5,000 residents with power um, in the town of Boone, as well as the university. They're, a very unique um, utility because they're actually owned by the university. And so Appalachian State is a state school. So that also means that they're technically owned by the state. Um, they operate as a nonprofit, similar to how co-ops operate, but they um, also are sort of run like a private owned in other ways in the way that um, they're run by the university. So there is, because they are a nonprofit, there is some leverage there to have them collaborate, but they don't, they're not an investor owned or a co-op um, like utility owned, ratepayer owned operation. Um, this past year, they launched the Green Power Program, which is where ratepayers can opt in to offset and buy their power from this hydro dam that's part of TVA that is in Tennessee, which is on the left here. Um, so again, customers have to opt in to this program. And additionally, um, it caused, so around average, the amount of the amount of power that people are consuming would add about 15% to their bill if they wanted to get all of their electricity from this hydro dam. Um, so there are some, so Appalachian Voices as that third goal that we had was really adding in new power to the grid. The other thing about this hydro dam is that it's been around for a really long time. We're not actually adding renewable, new renewable energy to the grid. So if we weren't buying it in the town of Boone, then someone else 
probably Duke would be buying it. And it's not, we're not really investing in additional renewables. So we're not, you know, reducing our carbon footprint, um, which is a really obviously big goal, I think for all of us here. Um, and, and as well with the town of Boone's climate goals. And that's something that we, um, that everyone has recognized. So Josh, if you wanna go to the next slide. So this campaign again is like very new. Um, and so where we are right now, so Appalachian Voices has been in the initial collaboration with both the town of Boone, Appalachian State and New River Light and Power. We actually held our first meeting with all of us together last week. Um, we will also be, we also met with a city council member and we'll continue to meet with other city council members and to really develop this win-win situation, hopefully where we are um, providing new renewables to the grid and also working with New River Light and Power and the university to help expand those programs and also address some um, billing financing for people who own their own solar. So the next steps in this program, um, please excuse the really ridiculously weird images, but we have to crunch the numbers and figure out exactly how this can be viable for both the town of Boone, what kind of new percentages we're looking at because the town of Boone has reached their climate goals. So we need to think about how do we celebrate that win, but also achieve more because it's totally possible. And additionally, a big push that we're working on is making solar more viable. So there are two ways that we want New River to do this. Um, right now they're on a, a buy all sell all rate pay system. So that means if you have solar panels on your house, you don't actually get to use the energy that they produce. You are still hooked into the grid and you have to sell all that energy back to New River Light and Power. And then you have to buy all of your energy back from them and you're not using what's on your roof. Um, so fingers crossed New River, uh, even last week was like, we know it's not fair. Um, so there is a, a hope that we'll get a um, probably net billing option for solar owners. And then addition to that, we're also looking at creating a leasing program where New River Light and Power or the town of Boone can lease people living in the municipality's roofs and they can install the solar and manage the solar and it'll go back into the grid. Um, so again, we're like very, very beginning phases of this and this will continue throughout the summer. Um, we have interns that are App State students. Um, we have lots of exciting buy-in from the community that will continue to expand. Um, so if anyone is calling in from Boone, you can definitely get in touch and we can keep you up to date with this. Um, Josh, if you wanna go to the next slide. So, we really want this to be a model for mountain communities utilizing energy resources. Um, something that we have heard a lot is that resiliency and climate resiliency is something that people are really concerned about. And so if we're increasing the amount of solar that we're generating ourselves um, and increasing battery backup as people buy into these programs, then we can really create this model for the mountains and more sustainable energy in local communities. Um, this is also part of another campaign. So I will be spending the next year working on the North Carolina People's Energy Plan. And I'll be conducting listening tours throughout the state and talking to any utility customer, no matter what type of utility and learning about what they're concerned about and what they wanna see differently. So um, this is gonna be launching in June. Um, I have my email on the slides if anyone wants to reach out and learn more about this program or um, New River Light and Power. If, but if you don't live in Boone and you wanna be involved, whether you're an organization affiliated or just an individual who's interested in giving comments about what you think about your utility or how you wanna see it change. Um, something that is like, I'm really passionate about is this idea of this being like omni, directional and education. So like us gain, gaining information from people and sharing the resources that we have at Appalachian Voices and other people sharing, you know, how their communities work and who we need to get on board with these different ideas. 
and will use this people's energy plan to lobby policy both at the state level, but then also at local levels. And um, it is our hope, fingers crossed, that uh, New River Light and Power will be a model for that. So that is all I have. Um, and I will go ahead and pass it over to Gabby to tell us about Tennessee. Everyone, thanks for being here tonight. I'm Gabby, um, Tennessee Energy Democracy Field Coordinator based in Knoxville. I've just been at App Voices since April, so I'm also newer here, but already immersed in a lot of inspiring ongoing work. So tonight in this short talk, I'll be focusing on some of the worker justice issues our team is actively organizing around in Tennessee. But before I dive in, I do want to note, you know, that our team's work includes everything from fighting unaffordable energy bills and racially uneven shutoffs in Knoxville to electric co-op reform, um, like other folks here have discussed, uh, to advocating for new Tennessee Valley Authority or TVA board members who will support clean energy and worker justice. And the scope of our work is big because energy touches our lives in so many different ways. And that's why it's so important for communities to be involved in these decision-making processes. So I'm gonna to start tonight by talking about the Kingston Coal Ash Workers Long Journey for Justice, and then some of the worker justice issues around TVA's proposed replacements for its coal plants. Next slide, please. So I know we don't have too many Tennessee folks on the line. So just as some background, and also I apologize for the, the text. Um, for some reason, the formatting like isn't transferring over. Um, so I'm sorry if it's hard to read, but I'll try to speak nice and slow. So in 2008, uh, what you see here is the largest industrial spill in US history, which took place in Harriman, Tennessee, a dike holding in coal ash from TVA's Kingston fossil plant, a coal plant ruptured, releasing 1 billion gallons of coal ash slurry into nearby rivers and land, with a force that knocked houses from their foundations. And this disaster was nearly 10 times the size of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill for scale. And coal ash is a toxic radioactive stew containing heavy metals and chemicals like arsenic, mercury, and lead. Next slide. So over 900 workers spent six years cleaning up this spill. And the working conditions they endured had deadly and disabling effects. Jacobs Engineering Group, or Jacobs, um, contracted with TVA to lead the cleanup, but failed to inform workers of the health risks. And there are reports of Jacobs even confiscating and destroying workers' personal dust masks because uh, they wanted to, people to, to feel like it was safe. And now over 220 workers have come forward in a lawsuit against Jacobs with lung diseases and cancers, while over 50 workers have died. Next slide. But the toxic impacts of this disaster didn't end there. The majority of the coal ash from this spill was shipped to the low income, predominantly black community of Uniontown, Alabama, and into an uncovered and unlined landfill where it easily becomes airborne and can also leach into groundwater. Community members there have organized to form the Black Belt Citizens Fighting for Health and Justice group. And have, uh, that group has been working with folks in Tennessee who were affected by the spill because these fights are inherently connected. Next slide. Now, and part of why I wanted to talk with y'all about this tonight, there's a critical court case for the coal ash workers coming up in exactly one week on June 1st. And the Tennessee Supreme Court will hear the next phase in a case between cleanup contractor Jacobs and the 226 workers and, and over 100 spouses who have filed claims. And this part of the proceeding is focused specifically on the injuries that workers sustain from the cleanup. Jacobs has asked for the court to classify coal ash as silica and mixed dust and for the workers to prove specific injuries that don't reflect the type of injuries that result from their exposures and, and that these workers are presenting with. So if the court rules in favor of Jacobs, it would set a harmful precedent for future coal ash injury cases 
and the Kingston workers and their families could receive no compensation for the tremendous losses and medical bills they've endured over the past 14 years. And so groups like App Voices will be gathering in Nashville to support the workers and their families on the first, and others are holding solidarity events leading up to the hearing. And this case is so clearly important for these workers and their loved ones, and it could also have ripple effects throughout coal impacted communities across the country. So the Kingston spill actually resulted in the first ever federal coal ash disposal standards, and the vast majority of coal ash in this country is still stored in ways that threaten community and environmental health. And so as the country is transitioning from coal and the EPA is also moving towards enforcing coal ash storage rules, and this is good, right? But how the ash is moved, where it is moved to, and how workers are protected are all questions of vital importance to energy democracy. Next slide. So now uh, TVA has announced the retirement of its Kingston and Cumberland plants. And our team is working really deeply on the replacement processes, which also involve really consequential decisions for workers. And right now, uh, TVA's expected preference for both plants are methane gas replacements uh, that re would require over 150 miles of new pipelines together. While I suspect y'all agree this is problematic for a lot of reasons, it also fails to deliver a just transition for the plant workers. In Cumberland City, for example, where TVA has officially announced their preference for a gas plant and pipeline, they're estimating only 25 to 35 permanent jobs will be created. And right now there's more than 250 people employed at the plant. And for their solar and storage alternative, which was, which is still something that they're considering, um, they haven't given a jobs estimate for, for how many jobs would be created. And this is all in a community that's uh, a little over 300 people living there. So the plant has an enormous impact on the economy. So workers in our communities deserve far better, but I do wanna emphasize that TVA's decisions are not finalized yet, but the Kingston plant, um, they're even less finalized. And so there's still time to weigh in and fight back, which our team is working to do alongside local communities. And so another point I wanna emphasize is that dealing with coal ash is, is a huge piece of a just transition. And there are a lot of jobs in this work that we don't always think about. And I wanna give just one more example of how the need for worker, environmental justice and democratic governance come together in this work. Near Memphis, TVA has already replaced one of its coal plants with gas. And there's an online coal ash pit on site that's threatening Memphis's drinking water. So it needs to be moved. And TVA made a plan and has begun hauling the coal ash to a landfill um, in a predominantly black South Memphis community. And this process is expected to take up to nine years, which is a long time and a lot of jobs. So for energy democracy, we need public input before decisions like this are made. And, and organizers in Memphis are have been really active in um, fighting and, and trying to make this process better. Um, and we need jobs that keep everyone safe and storage decisions that, that protect communities and the environment. And just before this webinar, actually, um, there was a coal ash safety training for communities in Memphis that we co-organized with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters Union. Next and last slide. Thank you, Josh. So returning to the Kingston coal ash workers case, it's really important to the families we're working with that we keep the Kingston workers in the news and honor their lives. And as a simple call to action, we're encouraging folks to stand in solidarity with the Kingston cleanup workers on social media. And I've put together a little toolkit to make it really easy, um, which, yeah, Jen, thank you for putting in the chat. So that has little templates for Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and some graphics that you're welcome to use. Um, encourage you to use the hashtag Remember Kingston. And if you have any thoughts or questions, um, my email's on the slide. Thank you so much for being here tonight. And that's all for me. Big thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you, Gabby. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you, Emily, for letting us know uh, just what is going on in each of uh, those three states. Uh, a big shout out to Jen for keeping up with uh, all the different links and calls to action in the chat uh, so that everyone can just stay up to date and make sure that they're following through on those actions.
We do want to go into an activity and a question and answer. However, before we do that, let me admit a mistake as your facilitator, which is I completely forgot to let all of us sit with the results of that first poll, which was uh, what different type of utility customers we had represented here. Oh my gosh, thank you so much, Jen, for pointing that up for me. Um, but as we can see, or I don't know if y'all can see that, uh, 16 or 14 of y'all or 64% were customers of investor owned utilities. Three of y'all or 14% of those who filled out uh, are member owners at electric cooperatives. And then five of y'all or 23% uh, are customers of municipal utilities. There is no one who was part of the chat tonight uh, who was an off grid customer. So that just lets everybody know uh, the makeup of uh, different utility customers that we had represented um, this evening. So like I said, uh, we want to move now into uh, another activity, which is a Jamboard discussion. Some of y'all uh, might have used Jamboard in uh, the past. And so I'm going to pull that up on my screen really quickly. So y'all should be able uh, to see my screen right here. And I think Jen is putting a link to this Jamboard in the chat. But what this should allow uh, is for folks to um, treat this like as a, as a community message board. So uh, on the left, you have various options. So if I click on sticky note, it will give me the option uh, to open a sticky note uh, and type a response. And so as you can see, uh, our first question here is what does energy democracy mean to you? And so energy democracy to me uh, is local communities uh, participating and uh, getting a say in where their energy comes from. So I can type that here. I click save. Folks should be able to see that then uh, on the Jamboard. For folks who've used this before, uh, it goes much deeper than that. Uh, you can add images, you can doodle a little bit. Uh, so we're really going to encourage folks to take some time. Uh, we have two questions, and so we're gonna to spend uh, just a couple of minutes, two or three minutes here on this first one. Uh, what does energy democracy mean to you? Uh, and so if you want to either put a sticky in or, or maybe pull an image that you have uh, that represents some energy democracy, um, we'll take some time to do that now. So I see someone put lower energy bills and less pollution, getting back to that idea of safe and affordable energy for everyone. I'm seeing worker protection, good jobs. Uh, workers should be protected. Again, that goes back to uh, something that Gabby talked about with the Kingston Coal Ash Bill, making sure that worker justice is a, is a really big part of energy democracy. A fair, just transition to a system that works for all in capital letters, big emphasis on all. Someone put people having a full understanding of how their utility operates and the power they have in their energy purchasing. Yeah, some more public education. This is really, really complicated stuff, making sure that everybody has access to education. We'll spend just a couple more minutes with, with the Jamboard or with this slide before moving on to the, the next part of the Jamboard. Users have choices is another sticky note that someone put in there. Level the energy playing field. 
if we'll just in like 15 seconds to add. And if you go to the top of your screen and click one over on, on these frames, we have another question for y'all to respond to. What are your top concerns about your utility or your energy system? I can feel free to start us off again. A, a big concern that I have and, and one that I advocate for, for on behalf of a lot is affordability. I, I'm really concerned that as we continue to transition towards clean energy, um, that rates, especially for low to moderate income folks, might go up. And so affordability is a big concern of mine. So again, you can get to that second frame by scrolling or going to the top of your window here uh, and going one over. Uh, and we'd love to, to see what are your concerns about your utility or your energy system. See someone put a monopoly board there, concerned about the monopoly, all the negative aspects that come with being or not having that utility choice. Someone's utility doesn't offer energy efficiency program for that household. So yeah, that's a big concern. Uh, energy efficiency, one of those programs uh, that lowers the amount of electricity that we have to generate, it lowers people's monthly bills. That's uh, really a, a win-win for all of us. And it's, it's concerning that utilities aren't offering that in, in an accessible way for all customers. I think that's a political puppet gift, if, if, I'm, if I'm guessing right. Uh, and if I had the, I'm not going to guess who put that there. Um, just going over uh, some other thoughts that folks have contributed to the Jamboard. $10 million paychecks, utility executives getting really, really high executive pay um, while many of their customers are facing uh, the threat of shut off on a monthly basis. Someone else said greenwashing by the utilities. Yeah, that corporate greenwashing kind of talking about how they're doing uh, good for their ratepayers, doing good, good for the environment. Um, but then they're going into those really wonky legislative hearings or, or regulatory hearings fighting for things like natural gas that aren't good for the environment, like greenwashing. We are going to take another 30 seconds to let folks use the Jam board, and then we are going to. Uh, move towards the question and answer portion of our discussion this evening. So I'll uh, just take a couple more seconds to leave us with some parting thoughts. Someone said racial injustice and access. Thank you all so much for, for participating with us in, in that exercise. Um, and thank you so much for, again, to all of our panelists and to y'all for, for being a, a really good audience. Now we're gonna move to uh, the question and answer portion of our uh, panel this evening. So if folks have questions for uh, our panelists, um, please feel free to put them in the chat now and we'll do our best or, or into the Q&A function in your toolbar uh, and we'll do our best to respond to them. I'm not seeing any any questions submitted in the Q and A section, so I'm guessing everybody here is. Josh, not there was um. Oh, thank Sorry you. to interrupt. There was a question from Carl in the chat. Cool. Let me scroll up and look for that real quick. Maybe for Gabby about TVA. 
sure. well, I guess it's not really a question now that I'm reading it, it's a comment, but. Yeah, I'll, I'll just add that's, that's right, Carl. I mean, so for those who don't know, the, the chief executive officer, CEO of TVA um, is the highest paid federal employee in America. And I think like someone or maybe Carl put in the Jamboard as annual compensation is about $10 million. So, pretty alarming, I agree. Jin just put the, the link to the Jamboard in the chat. Y'all are, are still free to participate. Um, and just want to see one more time, are there any questions from the audience for any of our panel members about the work that they're doing uh, in, in their own states or uh, about the concepts that we talked about? I'm seeing a, a question in the chat. For folks on the call who have investor-owned utilities, could you talk about what App Voices is doing on that? Jamie, is that for panelists? And if so, I'm wondering actually if Matt, you want to respond to that. Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, we did focus a lot of the energy democracy work. We think about a little more focusing on people's local energy systems, but for a lot of folks that is investor owned utilities. Um, and so you know, the, the two that we've, we've worked on most are, are Dominion Energy in Virginia and Duke Energy in North Carolina. Um, both, both of those, those companies have um, come kind of kicking and screaming into the clean energy economy. Um, they have not been um, the leaders we wanted them to be. Dominion's been a little bit better about that. The, the, the issue with, um, with Dominion that we've had the, the, the biggest problems with is just a real inequity, the, the ways that they use their power um, to really get legislation passed that is not in the public interest. It is in the interest of Dominion and Dominion sh shareholders. And that's that's generally our, our issue with in our energy democracy program with investor owned utilities. Um, the same is true with Duke Duke Energy in North Carolina, um, which is the most powerful lobby in North Carolina. Um, and so they routinely write the rules that, that, that regulate them. Um, and so we are there every year. Um, we've got uh, team members in Richmond uh, the day that the legislature opens every year in January. Um, and we've got in North Carolina, we have Josh, um, who's, who will be working the legislature um, when that starts up. Um, and, um, and yeah, we're just um, mostly mostly in, in, in both sta states right now. It's um, it, especially in North Carolina. It's mostly playing defense. It's trying to stop um, bad things that Duke does uh, while we um, pursue solutions at a more local level. Um, is 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 what I'd say. Josh, do you want to add anything more to the to the the Duke campaign? I, I think I could probably spend hours talking about the yeah, ability of problem, that. Right? Um, seeing as we're, we're getting closer to uh, the end of our programming, I do want to get to two questions that were just asked, one in the Q&A and then one in the chat, and we'll uh, start with the question that was asked in the Q&A, which is, what can I do to make changes at my utility? Uh, sometimes it seems kind of impossible. Wondering if there's any of our panelists who want to take a, a shot at, at him answering that one. It's a big one. Um, I guess I can just quickly say, I mean, I think some of the options depend a little bit on what type of utility you have. Um, but I think regardless of utility, one of the um, first things you can do is try to connect with organizations or other customers or members of that utility who are interested in change. Um, I think the more of us there are, the more powerful we are. Um, and so trying to yeah, to connect and um, see what avenues you there are available in your area to make your voice heard is definitely a first um, and I think really critical step. I'll just add to that. I don't know where the person who asked the question is located, but if you are in North Carolina and want to be involved in the people's energy plan as it unfolds, like 
that is a, a huge goal is that we're just building, as Emily said, more cohesion across groups across the state and building our capacity to really um, build our power and make change and have far reaching um, effects on the state. So definitely sign up for the Energy Democracy Y'all um, website, which will also have more information for each state actually as we provide further information about local co-ops and, um, and utilities in those states. Thanks for both of those yeah. answers, y'all. Um, I do want to, or yeah, let me pause and see if there's anyone else wanted to offer anything really quickly. Um, I do want to get to another question uh, that was, was put in the chat uh, from Carl. What is thought to be the lead with or best alternative clean energy uh, as an alternative to fossil fuels and other legacy sources? Uh, anyone who has particular thoughts on, on that question. I guess I'll just dive in. Um, I didn't introduce myself, by the way. My, my name is Matt. I'm the director of programs at, at Appalachian Voices. Um, so obviously been thinking about this uh, for 20 years that I've been working here. Um, and uh, you know, on it's it's what you hear about. It's it's not a mystery. It's not a, not a secret. It's solar, right? It's solar and increasingly affordable storage um, that makes solar a much you know better replacement for base load power. Um, that's the and and the best kind of solar is rooftop solar because you don't have to take over any agricultural land. You don't have to cut down any trees. Um, so that's what we'd really like. I mean, to, to us, I, I think that the gold standard is rooftop solar with storage. Um, not everyone can afford that. Um, and that's not not always the most cost effective solution in every every situation, but increasingly it is cost effective. And so yeah, I would I would lift that up as the gold standard. Um, but open to any other ideas, folks. Yeah, I'm not going to argue with that, Matt. Um, and we do have one more uh, question in, in the chat. Uh, and, and folks, we are beginning to run out of time, so we'll answer this one. And then uh, when we share the recording of this in a follow up email with folks, we'll also share the contact information for all of our panelists in case you have further questions. But I do want to be respectful of folks' time. A question from George, really quickly, though, is Is there any chance to reform Virginia's state corporation commission that regulates utilities? Um, I guess I can take this one since I'm the Virginia coordinator um, and maybe Matt, if you have anything to add, would appreciate that as well. Um, I think there are opportunities for us to, um, you know, speak with the commissioners and their staff and um, provide as much information and educa educational resources as we can about our particular issues. Um, but I would say that um, one of the bigger problems we're facing in Virginia is the control that the legislature has over electric utility regulation. And we have some of the worst campaign finance laws in the country, and that allows these electric utility monopolies to um, contribute hundreds of thousands and tens of thousands of dollars to individuals' campaigns. Um, and so there's definitely a conflict of interest and that makes it really difficult for us um, to have these utilities like Dominion and Appalachian Power be properly regulated in Virginia. Um, so the um, State Corporation Commission can't actually even fully do its job um, because the legislature has so much control um, over particular policies and outcomes for those utilities. Yeah, that, that answer seems great to me. I think that reforming the State Corporation Commission means reforming the legislature and the governorship of, of Virginia, because that's who, who appoints and approves approves them. But fortunately, we do have a lot of opportunities to intervene, um, represented by Southern Envi Environmental Law Center, and do in uh, just about every docket with, with that's, that's very important. So we certainly try to influence it a lot. Thanks, y'all, for those answers. Uh, and and as we just transition towards the end of our programming tonight, uh, thank, a big thank you to all of you for uh, being with us this evening. Uh, thank you to our panelists for participating. Um, 
we are, again, we've been here to celebrate the 25th anniversary of Appalachian Voices, 25 years of doing uh, this awesome type of work. And so as we celebrate that, we just wanna say we're incredibly grateful uh, for all y'all, our donors, our volunteers, uh, to our staff who have made uh, this vital work possible. Um, we wanna let y'all know that if you have any questions after, uh, you know, that have emerged from this evening or, or that you're just curious about, please feel free uh, to reach out to us. Uh, again, we will send contact information for panelists um, out in the follow-up email. And then just want to encourage all of y'all uh, to visit at voices.org slash 25 years. Uh, you can see it on your screen. I'll say that one more time. Appvoices.org slash 25 years. Uh, that will allow you to register uh, for more for more upcoming events. We're doing one of these on the 25th of every month. And we'd like for y'all uh, to join us and hear about all the work our other programs and teams are doing across the state. But thank you so much. Uh, we hope you have a, a lovely evening. Uh, and as we head closer towards a long weekend, we hope you have a great long weekend as well. So uh, thank you so much. <laughs>